Well, hello, hello, uh, this is Mrs. White, and this is a lecture on heart failure, uh, congestive heart failure, and uh, naming this one after a song, Harden My Heart. All right, so heart failure is a uh, pretty complex syndrome. It uh, basically is a mismatch of blood supply and oxygen to our tissues and our organs. So we have uh, more need than we can supply. So basically, it's a decreased cardiac output leading to decreased tissue perfusion. And it is the most common cause of hospital admissions for adults over 65. It can be associated with many cardiovascular diseases, but we do separate it into a couple of different types. One is uh, if the ejection fraction is reduced, and one if it is preserved. So some things to think about that um, there are uh, so many people who are living with heart failure. It's uh, important that we take care of this for folks. We have an aging population. It's a very costly disease to have. Not to mention the mortality and morbidity with it and the suffering that the patient goes through. So any interference with the mechanisms that regulate cardiac output can actually lead to heart failure. But there are uh, primary causes, precipitating causes. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about them, but in general, primary causes are any conditions that directly damage the heart versus precipitating causes, which are anything that kind of increases the workload of the heart. So some, some primary causes might be um, cardiomyopathy, diseases that you're born with, congenital heart defects, uh, pulmonary hypertension, rheumatic heart disease. Those are primary causes, among others. And some of the disorders that might cause heart failure might be anemia, uh, having a dysrhythmia, infection, nutritional def deficiencies, OSA or sleep apnea. So of the risk factors for developing congestive heart failure, though, the one of the biggest is hypertension. That is a modifiable risk factor. I do have a lecture up on hypertension. But we do know that if we can treat and manage hypertension, that we can decrease heart failure cases by 50%. And that is huge, my friends, huge. So let's talk about some of the types of heart failure. We'll start with left-sided heart failure. This is the most common form of heart failure. Basically, the left ventricle is not able to either um, empty adequately during systole, so when it's supposed to, or it's not able to fill adequately in diastole. So it's neither not pumping out enough or it's not filling up enough. And as a result of that, the blood backs up into the left atrium, and this is a good review of cardiac circulation uh, in reverse. So from the left atrium, the blood would then back up into the lungs. So I always think left-sided heart failure lungs. So, and left-sided heart failure can further be classified by uh, whether it's got a preserved ejection fraction or uh, reduced. So remember the difference, uh, re reduced is a systolic heart failure, which makes sense because systole is when the, uh, the heart contracts and pushes the blood out or um, preserved, which is diastolic failure, right? So systolic failure. I know I just kind of talked about it, um, but here it is for us. So things that cause our re ejection fraction to be reduced, and you should know the normal ejection fraction. And if not, here's your opportunity to go look it up. Uh, different sources say different things, but around 50, 55% uh, is around average, right? That uh, would be no cause for worry. So when the heart can't pump effectively, it cannot let the blood out. So um, it could be that's the reason, right? It's not pumping effectively. 
It could be that the blood pressure is just too high, the force is too hard for the heart to overcome, or it could just be mechanically there's something wrong with the heart. Now, preserved ejection fraction, this has more to do with the relaxation of the ventricles, so it's decreased stroke volume, right? If you, they don't fill up, then they can't let the fluid out. All right, so I like this picture. Um, this is from medconic.com. Uh, this shows you the difference between systolic and diastolic function and to understand that um, they can actually occur together. And if you want to pause and look at this, uh, I, I do. I just like this picture of them. Basically what happens to the heart, that stiff, thick heart muscle and diastolic, but it also gets thin and weak in systolic. Uh, whether we have a low ejection fraction or a normal ejection fraction. So... That's a, it's pretty interesting. And then here's another picture that I really like. This is uh, the difference between left-sided and right-sided heart failure and some of the patho behind it and the causes, right? So again, left-sided heart failure is the most common. Now, if we have right-sided heart failure, that's called coropulmonale. And at this point, the right ventricle doesn't pump effectively. And we have to then think about our pathophysiology and of the heart, which is the right side of the heart receives blood from the body. So if L means lungs, then R means rest of the body. So, and here's the kicker, most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. Of course, there are some other causes. Um, and again, Core pulmonale is when we have the dilation and hypertrophy. So they're often used interchangeably. So remember, we can have uh, both failures, so right and ventricular dysfunction. So basically, we end up with fluid building up plus our venous engorgement, and we end up with uh, increased, decreased. <laughs> like, isn't that crazy that I just said increased, decreased? So um, additional perfusion issues to our vital organs. So with all that going on, you would think, well, gosh, what's, uh, what's the body to do? Well, we can compensate for a lot of things going on with the heart. Uh, we call that the homeostatic regulatory system. Uh, basically, it, all of these things that the body does to augment preload and contractility basically maintain cardiac output. So we have the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system and the neurohormonal response of the RAS system, which basically uh, promotes sodium and water retention. So that neurohormonal response, basically as cardiac output is falling, renal perfusion decreases. Remember, the heart is sending uh, blood to the kidneys, and the kidneys absolutely need it. So at that point, renin would be released, and aldosterone from the adrenal cortex would result in sodium water retention, we would have peripheral vasoconstriction to increase our blood pressure, and then antidiuretic hormone released from the pituitary gland. The sympathetic nervous system gets in on it too because there's baroreceptors that sense low atrial pressure. Uh, it releases catecholamines, and that stimulates our beta adrenergic receptors in the heart, so for chrono, uh, chronotropy make it faster, and then ventricular contractility, which is inotropy, so it's the heart to beat harder and faster. Dilation is the enlargement of the heart chambers that occurs when there is increased pressure in the left ventricle over time. Now, initially, it's effective. This goes back to Frank Starling's law, which we talked about under cardiac assessment, but uh, eventually it's inadequate and cardiac output will decrease. Hypertrophy is basically uh, increased muscle mass, thickening of the wall of the heart. Again, initially effective, but over time becomes stiffer, hardens, uh, increased oxygen need of the larger muscle, poorer circulation, and risk of dysrhythmias. So remodeling is basically continuous activation of the neurohormonal response, so the RAS system of the sympathetic nervous system. 
The ventricles are getting larger but less effective in pumping, and this can cause life-threatening dysrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, which is why we're very careful with our medications, and we always want to give medications that can keep the patient from remodeling. So when we talk about that, that's what we mean, the uh, changes of the heart. Like if you were to remodel your bedroom, you might change something. And this is just a nice picture to show you what a normal heart looks like on the top and then what it looks like with hypertrophy and then dilation. All right, another thing that we have is the uh, natriuretic peptides. So we have ANP, uh, and, which is atrial, which you would think would be more with the heart, but uh, the one we, we measure for the heart is actually the brain B-type natriuretic peptide. So basically, these peptides are released in response to too much blood volume, and it tells the body to diurese, dilate, and lower the blood pressure. So this kind of counteracts the effects that we were just talking about, the sympathetic nervous system, which is saying, hey, man, let's constrict. So the higher the BNP is, the more heart failure we have. Some of the other things that we have here are nitric oxide and prostaglandin. So uh, nitrous is basically a smooth muscle relaxer, which can decrease afterload and also um, basically um, cause vasodilation. Prostaglandin, much the same. All right, so here are the stages of heart failure, which I think that you guys should be familiar with. Um, we have the American Heart Association stages of heart failure on the left and the New York Heart Association on the right. Uh, we do have on uh, the AHA a risk for heart failure and then some structural changes and then, then heart failure symptoms and then refractory heart failure versus the New York Heart Association, which again, you can look at this and take a look at it in your book, but this is the stages of heart failure. So the one thing we really need to talk about in this level, um, instead of just chronic heart failure, which we'll, we'll get to, but it's acute decompensated heart failure, right? This is a big deal. This is what will bring uh, patients to the hospital it's a sudden symptoms of heart failure, a decrease in their functional status, and if we don't do something about it, then they would actually do much worse, uh, worse than they, they could. Basically, in a nutshell, it's pulmonary congestion. So think about pulmonary edema and fluid volume excess. There's too much fluid because of sodium and water accumulation. Now, early on, the patient might just have sort of increase in their respiratory rate. In fact, with many changes in the body, that's one of the first things we see. Um, and a decrease in their PaO2, so they're having trouble oxygenating. And later, uh, the, the alveoli become filled with serosanguinous fluid, so they, uh, they also have interstitial edema, and that leads to, I mean, tachypnea, they're short of breath, and alveolar edema. So here's a picture of you, right? So pulmonary edema. So acute decompensated heart failure, I want you to think about as pulmonary edema. It's acute, it's life-threatening, the lungs and alveoli become filled with fluid, and the signs and symptoms look like the signs and symptoms of left heart failure. So among those, um, we'll, we'll talk about them, but basically, the uh, the biggest symptoms, some of the ones that patients complain about the most would be like orthopnea because of the fluid in the alveoli. Um, they could be pale, cyanotic, crackles and wheezes when you listen to them, that frothy sputum, they'll have difficulty breathing. And the blood pressure can either be high or actually low depending on the degree of heart failure. So they could go from um, basically pretty perfused to in shock. And that's why we have these clinical manifestations of whether they're uh, dry, warm, dry, cold, wet, warm, which is the most um, common, or wet, cold. 
So I found this picture. I think you would like it. Um, basically, it has to do with congestion and perfusion. So what would we want? We want a person warm and dry. But what they usually present as is warm and wet. They could be cold and dry. That means they don't have enough fluid. Or they could be cold and wet, which would be cardiogenic shock. So remember, um, a patient is wet due to volume overload and warm due to adequate perfusion. So how would you know they have adequate perfusion? It would be warm skin, good pulses. And how would you know they were wet? It would be congestion and dyspnea. And I have a little bit of the treatment down there, right? Vasodilators and inotropes. Uh, these are mainstays of treatment for basically what amounts to left ventricular failure. All right, so some of the uh, problems that can happen because of heart failure, um, acute and chronic, would be pleural effusions, uh, dysrhythmias, and dyssynchronous contractions. So like the, H, the ventricles are not contracting together. Uh, you could end up with a left ventricular thrombus, enlarged liver, cardiorenal syndrome, which is a big deal, right? Because the, the heart and the kidneys are so dependent on each other. And then, of course, anemia, which may be dilutional. All right, so how do we diagnose uh, heart failure? So diagnosis really centers around um, an echocardiogram, um, heart monitoring. They might even need ambulatory monitoring. So I know we bounce back and forth just a little bit over this one. But um, the BNP, cardiac stress tests. But again, this is just a review. So let's talk about some of the acute care for heart failure. Of course, the uh, person will need continuous monitoring and assessment. And that includes their vital signs, oxygen saturation, cementation, right? So any changes in mentation should uh, be a big warning sign for us. Um, their weight, their eyes and O's. You definitely want to position the patient in the high Fowler's position. If they're unstable, they may need hemodynamic monitoring by way of... Um, central venous pressure monitoring, and likewise, uh, they may need oxygen, BiPAP. So again, you could read all this. Um, at the end of the day, though, if they're having a mechanical issue with pumping, then we might need to give them a mechanical solution by way of an intraaortic balloon pump or ventricular assist device. But basically, our goal of therapy is symptom relief, supporting oxygenation and ventilation, optimize their fluid volume status, identify and address the causes of heart failure, avoid complications, and basically by the time they leave the hospital to make sure that they have good teaching so that they can avoid exacerbations in the future. So ultrafiltration is, um, there should be another little dot in between here. Ultrafiltration is its own thing. So let me just tell you, ultrafiltration is aquaphoresis, and that we use for patients with volume overload and uh, diuretic resistance. And here's a picture of a left ventricular assist device. So uh, this is basically a device that causes the person to have continuous blood flow, kind of bypasses the ventricles um, to make sure that the heart can pump the blood out. If this were the case, the person may not have a readily uh, monitorable blood pressure or a heart or a heart rate because it's like a continuous thing. So you would want to rely on signs of perfusion to tell you whether or not the person is doing well with this machine. So perfusion meaning skin color, mentation, cap refill, things like that. All right, so this is drug therapy for acute decompensated heart failure, which looks a little different than the treatment for chronic heart failure. So drug therapy for acute really does um, rely on diuretics to 
affect preload. And the most common that we're going to give is furosemide, but you may see the others. You may see um, bumetidine IV. Vasodilators, uh, basically to reduce the circulating blood volume, improve coronary circulation, of which you have IV nitroglyceride, IV sodium nitroprusside, IV naziratide. Be very careful with these medications, right? These are very potent vasodilators, so of course they're going to cause hypotension. So we're going to need to be very, very careful with our patient, make sure that, um, especially after we give them a dose, that we're right with them, that we're monitoring them, making sure they don't fall, because that is a huge risk for them. Uh, morphine is a wonderful drug for heart failure. It works on uh, so many ways. Uh, it improves alveolar gas exchange, improves cardiac output by reducing ventricular preload and afterload. It helps with the anxiety and that air hunger. And when I say air hunger, that's like that subjective feeling of dyspnea. We have the positive inotropes, so dibutamine, norepinephrine, milrinone, digoxin. These are the meds, again, for acute, so go ahead and write acute congestive heart failure drug therapy. One that you'll see missing here are um, things like carvedilol. So we'll, do, we'll use those for chronic heart failure, but not for acute decompensated heart failure, because when we use some of our um, beta blockers, our beta blockers, they can actually worsen heart failure. So we're very careful with those. We don't just add those in. Oftentimes they're held and then they may restart once we're past the acute phase. All right, so chronic heart failure, look at the manifestations. Um, again, fatigue, orthopnea, which is we ask a patient how many pills they're sleeping on. That would give us their orthopnea. A proxismal nocturnal dyspnea. Can you think about what that is? Do you know off the top of your head? So that's basically um, when a person lays down that they'll wake up with the feelings of fluid overload because the body starts to reabsorb the fluid and their lungs can't take up take uh, care of it, so they go flat, right? So that's when they wake up unable to breathe. Uh, so edema, maybe pitting. So all of these are potential. So treatment of chronic heart failure. Again, symptomatic relief, um, making sure that we balance rest and exercise. We do want the person to exercise. They should be in a structured exercise program, so um, like a cardiac rehab. So now let's look at the treatment, drug treatment. And again, when we when we have meds, you're responsible to know the medications, what they're for, their side effects. All right, so Joint Commission indicates that people who have uh, an ejection fraction under 40 should get an ACE inhibitor to decrease the progression of heart failure. That is just out there, right? Um, and ACE inhibitors are actually recommended for those who've even had a heart attack to prevent uh, development of heart failure. And also it is now the first line therapy for those with chronic heart failure. So you don't really see the ACE inhibitors and the beta blockers and those, they're not really, um, not really in the acute care. But here they are, they're uh, meant to be in chronic heart failure. So take a look at this and see what you may know and not know. So let's break down some of them. So some of the other medications, we have meds that inhibit the cardiac sinus node. Uh, something special about this one, um, which is an odd medication. You may or may not ever see it again. But if it shows up, I'd like you to know it. Uh, basically, the person with this med Corlinor basically must be in a sinus rhythm with a resting heart rate more than 70 so because this inhibits the sinus node. So think about what that will do. If we inhibit the sinus node, that's going to absolutely bring down the blood pressure, uh, the heart rate. So this is for those with reduced ejection fraction. 
diuretics, a very common class of medication for acute and chronic. They reduce edema, um, reduce preload, promote that sodium and water. Uh, and they could be either loop or thiazide diuretics, and they each have a little different swing to them, but all of them you need to monitor their potassium levels as well as their other electrolytes. Some of the other things we can do for chronic heart failure, um, because of how prone folks are to dysrhythmias, is to put the uh, in implantable cardioverter defibrillator, or, or AICD. We may do pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy. So that's when our ventricles aren't beating the way they should in unison, we can pace them both. If that's the, the case, we would need a dual lead pacer for the ventricles. And we could do a lot of remote monitoring these days, right? We could put these folks on like home telehealth and um, see how they do. Nutritional therapy, you will be responsible for teaching patients about diet and sodium and all the things that go along with it. So low sodium diet is absolutely recommended because of water following salt. We usually restrict their salt to about two grams daily. Those who have stage D heart failure will need a fluid restriction as well. And we have to teach the patient about weights. Remember to take the weight at the same time, wearing the same clothing. So we recommend first thing in the morning before they get dressed, you know, step on the scale and uh, see how they do. They need to report weight gains of three pounds in two days or um, three to five pounds over a week because that could show us that they have worsening heart failure. So as far as nutritional therapy, remember to look at foods that contain a significant amount of sodium and we should limit those, right? Two grams a day. So things like, of course, the salty six, that's, that's easy to look at, but um, a lot of our cheese products have salt in them, a lot of our dairy products. So be careful with those as well. So nursing interventions are basically based on the principles that you see here, that it's a progressive disease, that we need to make sure the person has good quality of life, and we do that by symptom management and self-management. And because it's caused and worsened by so many other conditions, we need to make sure we are addressing those. And that the person does need support systems. As far as nursing diagnosis, things that I think of off the top of my head would be like impaired gas exchange, impaired cardiac output, fluid imbalance, activity intolerance, right? So our goals are going to be decreasing their symptoms, decreasing their edema, increasing their exercise tolerance, that they're not going to have any complications. We need to really aggressively identify and treat those risk factors that we find to prevent or slow the progression of the disease. So you guys can pause and look here. These are all the nursing interventions that one could possibly do um, to, for heart failure. I mean, it's not an exhaustive list. You could definitely pick and choose and prioritize for your patient based on what you see. But when our person's in the hospital, we want to make sure we have a comprehensive discharge plan, that we have good collaboration and follow-up. We can't just let them go from the hospital and say, okay, there you are, good luck. Priority teaching upon discharge is um, basically the signs and symptoms of worsening heart failure. At the hospital I work at, we do a lot of um, remote monitoring technology. They're monitoring their weight, they're monitoring their blood pressure, if they're diabetics, they're putting their sugars in there. And all of this is transmitted to a nurse who reviews and starts to reach out to patients before they have the danger signs associated with the disease, right? So we'll catch them as their weight's just starting to go up so that they don't end up at the hospital uh, needing intubation. As far as patient teaching, you also want to make sure you teach them all about their medications and make sure that they have good compliance with their medications and of course, the signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperkalemia, that's very important, especially with our diuretics. You want to teach them about cardiac rehab and balancing their exercise and rest. 
And our folks really do need to have advanced directives in place. Heart failure, um, if the person becomes resistant to treatment, can actually, I mean, it will decrease their life expectancy. The person may end up needing like chronic inotropic therapy, mechanical circulatory support devices, um, palliative care and hospice, heart transplant. So these things, um, as the disease progresses, we should be on the forefront and talking to our patients. Right, as far as evaluation, we've already kind of talked about this. These are patient goals. Let's take a minute and talk about heart transplantation. Um, not, not too many people get heart transplants. Um, it is gold standard therapy. It's suitable for some patients in end-stage heart failure. There's 3,000 on the list currently. About 2,000 hearts are available. But uh, the survival rate's up to 90% for the first year and 75% at the third year. There is a selection process that identifies the patients who would most benefit from a donor heart. They must undergo a comprehensive physical, diagnostic, and psychological evaluation. And then if they're proven to be good candidates, then they're placed on the list. And if a patient is stable, they're at home while, and receive ongoing care while they're waiting. Unstable patients may need to be hospitalized. It's a long wait. Many patients die waiting. Some of the indications of a heart transplant would include end-stage heart failure, so stage D. But there's other factors at play, right? The ability of the person to cope, their family support, and their motivation to follow up with the rigorous post-transplant care. So just because a person has a chronic disease doesn't mean they can't get a heart, right? They just have to have well-controlled chronic disease. And you can see the process of a heart transplant here and a picture of a heart ready for transplant. Of particular importance to us as nurses following a heart transplant would be post-transplant monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of complications that can occur. Um, acute rejection is the immediate concern. Um, and we use immunosuppressant therapy. That's key for post-transplant management. Uh, in the first year after transplant, the uh, most common causes of death would be acute rejection and infection. So the immunosuppressive therapy that we use is tracrolimus, uh, mycophenolate. So basically, there's a risk for cancer when we suppress the immune system. And the immunosuppressive therapy can also cause something called uh, Cardiac vasculopathy, which you see there, it's, it's sort of like an accelerated coronary artery disease. So post-transplant, we have endomyocardial biopsies are done uh, from the right ventricle. They're done weekly for the first month, then monthly for the next six months, and then yearly thereafter. And that is to detect rejection. All right, so nursing care of the person post-transplant would basically focus on helping them adapt to the process, monitoring their heart function, looking for signs of complications, and providing ongoing teaching. You can see here, it's a, it's a beautiful picture of some obviously heartbroken parents listening to their child's heartbeat in that man. So um, I encourage everybody to be an organ donor. Okay, let's do a couple of questions and we'll wrap this up. Patient with history of chronic heart failure hospitalized with severe dyspnea and a dry, hacking cough. Assessment findings include pitting edema in both ankles, blood pressure 170 over 100, pulse 92, and respirations 28 breaths a minute. Which explanation, if made by the nurse, is most accurate? So your choices are the assessment indicates that venous return to the heart is impaired, causing a decrease in cardiac output. The manifestations indicate impaired emptying of both the right and left ventricles with decreased forward blood flow. The myocardium is not receiving enough oxygen supply or enough blood supply through the coronary arteries to meet its oxygen demand. Or the patient's right side of the heart is failing to pump enough blood to the lungs to provide systemic oxygenation. 
So pause it and then press play when you're ready. Okay, let's look at the answer, right? So the answer is B. The patient is experiencing acute decompensated heart failure with symptoms of both right and left-sided heart failure. So remember, left-sided heart failure prevents normal forward blood flow and causes pulmonary congestion, and the right-sided heart failure causes a backup of blood and results in venous congestion. All right, so we have a patient with left-sided heart failure provide as prescribed oxygen at four liters per minute, nasal cannula, furosemide, spinolactone, and enalapril. Which assessment should the nurse complete to best evaluate the patient's response to these drugs? So you're gonna either observe the skin turgor, auscultate lung sounds, measure blood pressure, or review intake and output. So the answer is in the question. It says it's left-sided. So we see left-sided heart failure preventing normal blood flow and will cause the blood to back up into the left atrium and into the pulmonary veins. The increase in pulmonary pressure causes fluid extravasation from the pulmonary capillary bed uh, into the interstitium, then the alveoli, which causes pulmonary congestion and edema. So the best way to find out if the drugs are working is to listen to the lung sounds. Question three, home care nurse visited a patient with chronic heart failure who's taking digoxin and furosemide. Patient reports nausea and vomiting. Which action is most appropriate for the nurse to take? You can either perform a distic urine, notify the health care provider immediately, have the patient eat foods high in potassium, or ask the patient to record their weight in the morning. Hopefully you chose to notify the healthcare provider immediately because basically um, remember that loop diuretic can promote potassium excretion and digoxin toxicity increases if the uh, potassium is low. All right, guys, that's what I got for you on congestive heart failure. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this comprehensive lecture on heart failure, uh, go ahead and give me a a like and a, and a follow. Thank you so much.